Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, great is your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. May all that hear your word know that your son is life. Life everlasting. And you want us all to have him in our life, a part of our life, in our life, about our life. Jesus, we thank you. We ask, Father in heaven, that you would let us hear what the Spirit is saying today. In Jesus' name, amen. In the light of who Christ is, we seek to have the same attitude as the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, boy, isn't that a challenge? In light of who Christ is, we work out our salvation. We work out, we work, we work into our life the truth that we are saved through the mercy of God. We work it into our life in the fear of the Lord. If you've received Jesus as your Lord, his spirit indwells you. In light of all these truths of our attitude to be the same as Christ, that we work out our salvation in the fear of the Lord, we are encouraged, we are given this verse in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, as an encouragement. For it is God. Let's read this together. Here we go. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. What a great promise. We are working through the second chapter of Philippians, literally phrase by phrase, word by word, and in light of who Christ is, in light of living in the, in the fear of the Lord, which is the previous verse, in light of our salvation, be encouraged that this, this is a promise, this is an invitation that, that we can be confident in decision making. You can. It is God who works in you. This is a strong statement of faith and of truth. God works. That word works. We, we unpacked it last week. It, the original language is where we get the word energy. It is God's energy at work in your life. It is the power within that is his Holy Spirit. That is, he is active, operating in you to produce an effect. And when we submit ourselves to the lordship of Christ, when we live in the fear of the Lord, there is an activity of the presence of God that increases. He works in you. This is an emphatic you. He works unto you, with you, by you, and through you to will and to act, to want to do something and then to actually do it. That's Philippians, the first part of that verse. We unpacked it last week. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his, say with me, good purpose. This phrase, good purpose. This whole verse is about relationship. It's about abiding in the Lord Jesus. It's about really knowing his presence. It's about how God working in your life and that he is active in your life and there is in partnership with your will operating to produce something as you allow him to work in your life. This, your will becomes his will and this consistently, he's consistently inviting us to act out his will in his good purpose. His good purpose. Today is an invitation for us to allow God's good purpose to take the next step in our life. Not our purpose, not my opinion, not what I think should happen, but God's will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. How should we pray? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Opinions are a dime a dozen. They are worth nothing in eternity. 
Nothing. Only thing that matters is the kingdom of God. God working in you and through you. Ooh, that one that hurt, didn't it? That one hurts for most Americans. Because we really have our opinions. By the way, it's not just Americans, by the way. It's everybody. I don't care where I go. Everybody has an opinion. I love uh, my former pastor, Pastor Tom, who's in heaven. He used to say, you know, he'd want to grab people's face and say, it's not your party. (laughs) It's the Lord's. The Lord wants his good purpose in your home. The Lord wants his good purpose in your life, through your life. The Lord wants his good purpose in your marriage. The Lord wants his good purpose in your relationship with your children and with your grandchildren and with your parents and with your grandparents. He wants his good purpose throughout your life. It is the reason for our existence. And God works in his incredible great power. And that power is like the working of his mighty strength that she exerted when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That power. That power. For the one who believes in Jesus, for the one who follows Jesus, for the one to whom his spirit indwells, for the Christian, God is able to do immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine according to the power that is within you and works in us and through us. God's objective, his motive is revealed in this verse. It's revealed. His good purpose for his namesake, for his glory. Now, Think about, just for a minute, just close your eyes for a minute. Just think about this last week. What was the best meal you ever ate this week? I mean, what's the best meal? Okay, can you, you know, can you get a hold? Maybe there was, maybe it's, maybe you have to go back a couple weeks, okay? And boy, you enjoyed it. You savored it. And then you wanted to tell someone about it. Okay, open your eyes. Can you imagine, imagine this, imagine the best dessert you ever had. Maybe it's a vanilla ice cream with uh, chocolate over it, over the top of a warm brownie. And as you savored it, it uh, you, you were like, oh, this is so good. You want someone to know what you're feeling about that, right? Or maybe, as you're like me, I'm, no apology here, I'm a carnivore. I have that wonderful steak cooked to perfection, seasoned with just the right amount. And you just enjoy it. And you're like, oh, you want to tell someone. Or maybe, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's uh, on a hot day, a cold glass of water like you've never had before. And it, and it just quenches the thirst unlike anything. Boy, I was thirsty today and I drank this water. It was so good. Or maybe it's you were walking through a garden, maybe of roses, and the the aura of the smell of the roses came forth, and it was just a moment. Or maybe it was like this often where it's the end of the day and there's a sunset, and you're witnessing it, no one else is around you, and you're thinking, wow, what a moment, and of course, then we bring out our cameras or our phones and we're taking pictures so that we can, you know, show someone what we just experienced. What I just described to you is life. We, we are constantly looking for to share our, what, what brought us pleasure. Last Memorial Day, just a, you know, a little over a month and a half ago, I was in Washington, D.C., on Memorial Day, and I, and I, I you know, we, <laughs> when we go on vacation, it is not, uh, you know, let's sit around and just relax, 
You know, I, relaxing to me is hiking, a mountain, doing something that, you know, exerts a lot of energy. And, and so we're like hoofing it all over D.C. to see everything. And well, by Memorial Day, we'd been there a couple days. My wife was like, uh, you know, I'm going back to the hotel. <laughs> and the kids are like, see you, Dad. So I'm literally by myself on the National Mall. And there's just like all these marching bands playing. There's all, t- I mean, tens of thousands of people there. It's really, an, and they're getting ready for this big parade. And I'm thinking, well, what am I going to do? Well, you know what? I think I'm going to go uh, to this subway station. So I'm headed over there. It turns out it's not a subway station. I made a mistake, but I ended up where all the floats are. And they're getting ready for this big parade, and they're all lined up. And I, I come across a float that was from the nation of Kuwait. Put that picture up there. And I ended up, I walk up, and I have my veteran's hat, Desert Storm veteran hat, and I walk up, and I'm like, I look at their float, and they have this big sign that says, thank you, Desert Storm veterans. And I walked up, and I went, wow. I said, I started talking. There was a lady from Kuwait, the Ministry of Information, they called it, and she came over and said, thank you. I said, well, what are you guys doing? She says, we have been here since you liberated our country. We come every year. And I was with these two uh, colonels from in the Kuwaiti military, and, and it was so, something, as I was talking with them, one of them pulled me close, and he says, he looks me in the eye, and he's tearing his eye, he says, thank you for liberating my people. And I, I, you know, I was with 3,000 four-square pastors, and that moment was the most encouraging moment And here were four Muslims encouraging me far greater than the church was, which was great. I'm not diminishing it. It just was a moment. And some of you are challenged by that. I don't care. (laughs) It was my moment. It was something God gave me. And the truth is, is that those moments are different for all of us. And I, I'm thinking as I'm walking away, I wish my kids were here. I wish my wife was. I'll never forget what the Holy Spirit spoke to me. This wasn't for them. This is for you. You know, the truth is, is that we, we have these moments and we want people to feel what we feel. We want them to understand our experience. But they can't. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 10 says this. Each heart knows its own bitterness or grief, another translation says, and no one else can share in its joy. As a human being, we cannot fully give each other the joy that we feel for a moment for this and that. We can share a moment, but it, may, it will be different for each of us. That's the human condition. That is the the reality of our being. That is what it means to be human, that I cannot fully know your experience. You cannot fully know my experience. Even though we want it. But hear this. But we serve a God that will let us know his experience. While we can't do that with each other fully, God can do that with each one of us. Some of us might feel or believe this, but God, that, that God is distant and, and, and almost disinterested in our life and cannot be known to the measure you want. That is not true. That is not true. You can know the Lord. In a closeness. But you must seek. He invites. And you must ask. You must knock. You must be looking for him. We can. We can. God, what God's pleasure, his good purpose, we can know. We can know. When it says, for it is God who works in us to will and to act according to his good purpose. That phrase, good purpose, literally can be translated his pleasure. What pleases him. 
We can know that. This verse is about relationship. It's about God in us, through us, working in us, actively a part of our life, and him wanting us to know that he's there. But again, we back up to the previous verses, context. Your attitude should be the same as Christ. That you're to work out your salvation in fear and trembling. The sense of God is God and I am not. And because of his son, I have the opportunity. This will, if I live this way, if I begin to discover this, the measure of this verse, it will affect how I relate to him. It will affect how I relate to people around me. Will I be perfect? No. Perfection is always elusive to us human beings. But it doesn't take away from the, the, when his pleasure is known to us, how it inspires us to still strive for that perfection without ever losing the sense of confidence and peace that comes through his son. You know, there could be no better expression of purpose than what you saw in that opening video. I couldn't think of any better expression of it than a people who were lost in darkness and a message of the Savior arrives, a miracle is done, and an entire family upon family, generation upon generation is changed. Now, guess what? I just didn't describe some tribe in the Solomon Islands. I just described you. For we were lost in darkness. And because of his great mercy, he sent his grace through the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. And we have discovered life, life in Christ. This idea, good purpose in this verse is, could also be benevolent purpose and pleasure. His pleasure the things that you find pleasurable, you want other people to experience. Hey, I want you to know this. I do it all the time. And my wife's like, yeah, 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 whatever. <laughs> they don't want to own it. They don't want to own what you enjoy. That's because you enjoy it. But God wants us to know what he enjoys. Because when we know what he enjoys and we receive what he enjoys, it becomes what, he, it becomes what we enjoy. We find out what pleases him. You may feel you have failed. You may feel unworthy. You may feel disconnected. But God loves you. And he sent his son to live and to die so that you and I may have life and have it fully. God works in the Christian. God works in the follower of Christ precisely because it pleases him. For it is written, the Lord delights or takes pleasure in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. It is written, the steps of a good man, or if I may say woman, are ordered by the Lord, and he delights and takes pleasure in his way. It is written, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the afflicted with salvation. And it is written, and I want us to say this out loud, put up Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Put that up there. It is written, let's say this together. It is written, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, accordance with his pleasure. His pleasure. In the book of Luke, it's recorded that Jesus appointed 72 of his disciples to go out ahead of him. He was was giving them on-the-job training before he was crucified, before he ascended into heaven. Before all that, he, he was training them up, and he picked 72, and he appointed them, sent them out to places where he was going to eventually go. He was like getting it ready for him to come. 
Which, by the way, is very significant because that's how he deals with us. He'll send us forth before he's coming. You know, some of us may feel, man, this is so hard trying to, trying to share the love of Christ with someone. They just don't, they want nothing to do with anything I'm saying. And you feel like a failure. Well, guess what? That's because maybe Christ has not shown up yet in their life, but he sent you ahead of him. Consider that a privilege. That he, it's his good pleasure that he gave you the hard job. And, and as I'm saying that, some of you are realizing that's what's going on in your life right now. So be encouraged. It is God who is working in you to will and to act according to his pleasure, his purpose. That is what he does. So he sent them out. before. This is where he's going to go. So he sent them out first. And he told them, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. The, you know, ask the Lord of the harvest for, for help. Which some of, the, some of you are... You are trying to do the will of the Lord. You are trying to help the Lord in this area or that area, maybe inside of the church, outside of the church. You are trying. You just feel like you don't have help. Well, he just told us what to do. Ask. It is the Lord that sends help. I can't manipulate people into helping. I can't, you know, guilt them into helping. That lasts about, what, 90 seconds. But the help that you need is from the Lord. And he will send people that will have a heart, will have an, a willingness to partner with you. And we need to ask the Lord for that help. And then he said to them this, I, I am sending you to heal the sick. He says, I'm here. And to tell that the kingdom of God is near. And so there you have the connection of healing and the kingdom and evidence of the kingdom of God. Where healing is, physical, God's miraculous, there is evidence of the kingdom of God. That God sent his son, not just to save us, but to bring the kingdom into our life. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ that healed when he was on planet earth and then ascended and sent his Holy Spirit is the same one that heals today. Jesus is our healer. He is the great physician. And where his kingdom comes, healing is also amongst that. And last year, I shared this in February, last year, 78 people said that God physically, emotionally healed them in, through the ministry of Kingsway. Last year. To the glory of God. That the kingdom is near. And he, all, he went on to say this. He who listens to you listens to me. And he who rejects me rejects you. None of us want to be rejected. None of us want to be told, we don't want to listen to you. But the truth is, if I'm sent... I'm living in the spirit of the fear of the Lord. If I attitude is seeking to be the same as Christ, if I know God works in me and to will and to act according to his purpose, when I'm sent and I'm rejected, they are not rejecting me. It is not personal. It is really between them and the Lord. Believe me, I had to get over this real fast. Okay? It is the Lord that they are rejecting. Well... Who are you to say, you're, I, you know what? When you are walking in the life of Christ and you are seeking to do the right thing in the right way for the right reasons, and sometimes we get corrected in that process, but eventually you start getting it. And you're rejected. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the Lord. We must never forget that. That it is he who sent. So the, the 72 went out. And what happened? People were healed. They were received. Some weren't. But they came back with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submitted to us because of your name. And Jesus said to him, I says, I have given you authority to overcome the power of the enemy. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submitted to you. 
Don't make a big deal about that. Don't get all, you know, woohoo! Don't get, don't get, don't get wrapped around an axle. Okay? But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Your names are written in heaven. And then it says something very powerful. So they, he sent them out. They were with purpose. They got rejected. They got received. Miracles happened. Stuff happened. And at that time, Jesus, it says, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said these words recorded in Luke chapter 10, verse 21, said these words, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little, to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. Pleasure. God is pleased. You, you don't really and truly know someone until you know what makes them happy. I mean, truly, you don't know, really know someone until you know what makes them happy. You know, our pleasure is, is a measure of our character. The truth is, is, so it is with God. We can only know his greatness of his glory when we know what makes him glad and happy and pleasurable. Therefore, we must understand what it means to know the pleasure of God. Because God is most glorified in us when we know his pleasure. And when I know his pleasure, I am changed. And God takes pleasure in his creation. He takes pleasure that he, all that he has made, including you and I, he looks at us and sees that it is good. He takes pleasure on us. He takes pleasure in his son, Jesus. That's why we're pointed consistently to be like the Lord Jesus. In the book of Matthew, Jesus went down to the Jordan. He was, fo he was, he was following the Holy Spirit. And John the Baptist was baptizing people, calling them to repentance. And Jesus shows up and asks to be baptized. John, not wanting that, resisting it, he's saying, I should be baptized by you. He was reluctant. And it says that Jesus said, this must happen to fulfill all righteousness. I need to tell you, some of you are, have not fully discovered the full pleasure of the Lord in your life because, hear this, you've not been water baptized in obedience to what, what the scripture says, when you surrender your life to Christ, what must we do to be saved? To, be, to repent and to be bad, baptized. In other words, immersed like Jesus was immersed. We can do that behind that secret curtain right there. No, just kidding. <laughs> Actually, we removed that and there's... And we could do that. You need to say something. I need, as I'm saying that... Someone's thinking, I should do this. Yes. Well, I, they're going to know that I've, you know, I've been a Christian for a while. I'm not done. So what? So what? This isn't about other people's opinions. This is about the pleasure of God. And as soon as Jesus came, was baptized, he came out of the water. And it's recorded that, that the Father spoke from heaven once the Spirit descended him like a dove and lightning. We always leave the lightning part out. But like a dove, the Father spoke these words in chapter 3, verse 17. This is my son who, who, uh, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. When we're obedient, even when we don't need to do that to fulfill some necessity, when we're just obedient, the pleasure of the Lord is there. We are formed like his son. More and more, we will please him. I, I've heard it said this way, that you can tell the excellency of a soul by what they delight in. What do you take pleasure in? My encouragement to you is to seek to align your pleasure with his pleasure. As it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, for you were once in darkness, but now you are 
light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And here it is. And find out what pleases the Lord. Find out that I can't give that. I'm teaching you this, but I can't, I can't make you do this. You have to find this, to know his pleasure, to believe in his pleasure, to obey his pleasure. When you know what is right and you choose to do it, that pleases God. And you can know that pleasure. Search the word to know, find out what pleases him. And let your motivation be in step with his pleasure. In the end, knowing his pleasure really is the byproduct of your faith. As it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11, it says this, We constantly pray for you, that our God may count you worthy of his calling, that, you, that by his power, his energy, his energy, that's the same word, may, f- may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. And that purpose is the same word that's used. In other words, there's this marrying of God's will and my will. I'm in step. Psalms 91 verse 14 says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you in your sight, O Lord my rock and my redeemer. Or Proverbs chapter 11, verse one. I mean, there's a lot of verses in regards to this. The Lord adhors dishonest scales, but at accurate weights are his delight or his pleasure. When we discover and look at the word, what pleases God? And we do it. There is an, you know, this really is an aspect of what I would call the fear of the Lord. One I didn't even unpack a couple weeks ago. And an aspect of the fear of the Lord, and if you go into the Old Testament, you'll, you'll find different passages that refer to this idea. And it's this, that I don't want to be out of his pleasure. I, there's this motive in my heart, I don't want to be out of his pleasure. And so as a result, that is the fear of the Lord. That's an aspect of it. And knowing his pleasure is focusing on what promotes his goodness, good purpose. What promotes goodness, his goodness? Having faith that God is good and he's at work and his good purpose will come about. That's, a, that's an incredible amount of faith in the midst of challenges to believe that even when it's not going my way, Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose, and that's to be conformed to the likeness of his son. What if you find yourself in a place where you you know that you're outside of his pleasure? Welcome to the club. Been there. I'm going to show you what I do. Can I show you what I do? Pretty simple. I take communion. You know, by the way, you don't have to do this only at church. Did you know that? You can do this on your own. Um, you can take a piece of bread and a little grape juice, and you could do this by yourself. It's, it's not wrong. Do this in remembrance of me, and I remember what he's done, that he's my savior. You are my bread, so I eat it. I sinned against you. Forgive me. I receive your forgiveness. That's what I do. By the way, I immediately feel his pleasure. Not because I did something right. Because he already loves me. I don't have to earn his love. And you can know that pleasure. You can know that love. Faith in his mercy, his good pleasure. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight or pleasure yourself in the Lord. 
and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn and the justice of your cause like the noonday. One of my favorite stories, Christian history stories, many of you know it, is about a guy named Eric Little. I love that story. I mean, I spent probably two hours this week just watching documentaries on his life just because I just, I, I just love to hear about the, you know, the heroes of the faith. And Eric Little was called the Flying Scotsman. He was born on 16th January 1902 in China. He was a son of Scottish missionaries. At the age of six, him and his brother were sent back to England to, in boarding schools, as, as was the custom of the time, and separated from his parents and his sister. And they were raised in this boarding school while his sister, Jenny, and his parents went back to China. And after spending, uh, going through school, he ended up going to uh, uh, Edinburgh for, uh, for, for college and university. His parents would come back occasionally for furlough, and they would spend time there. Little uh, went on to Edinburgh University, and he became well-known as the fastest man in Scotland. And, in, and many of you know this story. In 1924, in the Summer Olympics in Paris, he refused to... Uh, he actually refused to uh, um, run on a Sunday because he, he took it serious when he says, you know, take the Sabbath. Which, by the way, I do too, but it's not Sunday for me. It's Thursday. So if I don't answer your, the call on, you know, on Thursday, you know, don't get offended. He was, not offend, he was not worried about offending the government of England by refusing to run on Sunday. He, he wanted to please God more than his own country, and he gave up the race that he was projected to win. He won the gold in another event during the week. He went on, uh, and by the way, that race was projected to be won by the Americans. He left there and went uh, back with his brother to China, where he served the Lord, and he only returned to Scotland two more times in his life. And in 1943, he was interned in a Japanese camp because of World War II. And he, he influenced the entire camp, the children, the youth. People were, were strengthened in their faith by his attitude towards what was happening. And while they were in the camp, just three months before the camp was liberated, he became gravely ill. And he died. But just the day or two before he died, he, uh, he, there was a Salvation Army band that was playing outside. And he sent a note from his bed. And he asked them to play a song. And it was, Be Still My Soul. And I want to read you the, the phrase here. It says, Be Still My Soul. So on his deathbed, this is what he was asking. This is what he was singing. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. And every change he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend. Though thorny ways leads to a joyful end. He understood what the pleasure of God was. It wasn't just about his missionary work. It was also about that he made him fast. In the early 80s, many of you know the, the Academy Award winning movie, The Chariots of Fire, was made about his story. About him choosing not to run. And then he ran during the week. Well, when he ran during the week, uh, his sister and his parents did not want him to do it. They wanted him to go to England, not go you know, be with the world. But he, he wanted to be with the pleasure of God. And one of the things that caused him to know God's pleasure was running. I want to show that last scene of that movie because it's so inspiring, so communicates exactly what I'm talking about. So we're going to watch it and then conclude. Let's watch that. Great story, true story. 
a true story. We can know his pleasure. You can know his pleasure. But you have to want to know his pleasure. You have to seek to know his pleasure. You have to obey his pleasure. Let's bow our heads and we'll conclude. Lord, we just thank you for your word. May each one of us know your pleasure in a new measure today. And if you've missed a season of knowing his pleasure, the invitation of the Lord stands. He stands at the door of your heart and knocks. Just open your heart. Follow him. Discover what pleases him. And you will fully know that pleasure. Not just know about it, but know it. The Lord's peace be upon you. Amen. Let's all stand. Go enjoy this beautiful day. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Have a great and blessed week. Pray for our middle school camp that happens this week. Be praying for you. We, have, we certainly can use some help with uh, uh, both with uh, the, the kitchen. You can talk to someone in the back back there. Olympic Christian School back there if you want to talk with them. God bless you. Have a great week. I am broken at your feet.